The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! Go Cowboys! This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. It is the draft show here at the uh, Star in Frisco. Brian brought us manning the mic one more time. How about that? <laughs> Can't get rid of me. I'm like gum on your shoe. Mm-hmm. They brought you back. It brought me back. It's like the yeah. It's like the, the movie The back. Godfather, right? Uh, I haven't seen it. Godfather. Never, never, never I've never crazy. seen The Godfather. Never either. seen The Godfather. It's, God, it's Godfather Three. Every is the time. One you're talking about. Every time I try and get out, they, they pull, pull me, me back, back in. in. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's the that's the 1990 one. That's the one that's not very good. Godfather Noted. Yeah, Noted. Noted. You need to see The Godfather. I've been on like a big mob movie kick recently. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I've had like three conversations about The Godfather in the last week. So I do need to watch Need it, to watch. So the three's not worth it, though? I mean, it's just it's stupid. It came around like 16 years later. Uh, I, I don't know. Like uh, Mario Puzo needed a buck or something. And so they, they made a third movie. And it was a waste of time. And it had Sofia Coppola in it. And she couldn't act. No. So. Well, here's, here's, here's not a waste of time for you. We're going to talk some draft today. Yeah. We're going to talk some draft. We're, we're inside a week. Uh, well, it's actually draft week. Yes. So um, I'll introduce my scouts here. Nick Harris, Bobby Belt, Aisha Morrison, Chris Beamer in the back. Uh, I want to go around the room, and here we are really days away. We're starting to count down the hours. I want to go around the room and just give me one thought about it. It doesn't have to be about a player. It doesn't have to. Maybe it's something you're hearing Maybe it's something that, you know, you're feeling about this draft. Give me one thought, Nick Harris, that you're kind of right now feeling about as we get this started this week. Yeah, I'm wondering when the trades will start firing off, you know, away from the Cowboys pick. I, there's a certain level of expectation that I think we we could all have for the Cowboys trading back in the first round. I think if uh, a certain a certain crop of guys are not on the board at 24, then they, they start getting on the phones. But aside from that, when do the trades start firing off for whoever's going to hop into the top five to get J.J. McCarthy? Um, who, who's going to be that team that kind of slides back to, uh, to be able to get um, a better position with a, a defensive player, but also pick up draft capital in that top 10 so uh they that's monday you would have to think those uh those things start firing off here in the next 48 hours but it also could be on draft night that's that's kind of the thought that i have coming into today um, but as far as the cowboys pick goes specifically um offensive line obviously i think for me this is kind of where i'm leaning right now mm-hmm. if there are three guys that are not available at 24 then i think they parachute back and i think those three guys are uh, Troy Faltanu, uh, J.C. Latham, and Graham Barton. I think if those three guys are not on the board, then they they push back. But that's kind of my thought right now. Aisha, got a thought for me. Your second draft you've been a part of, mm. done a hell of a job to get it to this point right now. Probably a little tired. We're all a little tired. <laughs> Probably a little irritable. <laughs> you got a thought for us on where you feel like uh, where where you are right now? I I think. We talked about it on the draft 101 thing. I think everyone. By the way, hell of a job by all you guys too on that. Thank you, thank you. You too, Brian. Thanks to the fans out there, Cam. Lord, I just, (laughs) I just think. uh, I've learned to deal with that though. I should. Bobby, yeah. No, like. Yeah. Bobby, Bobby's, Bobby's good. Uh, No, I. uh, So I, I think that. I feel like a lot of us are kind of dead set on it being offensive line for this first round. Yeah. I don't know if it's just me because I like chaos. Yeah. But I, I just feel like maybe they might surprise us uh, in how they handle that first round. Like, you know, we talked about, um, obviously, offensive line is a need. They've had success in uh, getting offensive line in the first round and all those things. But I just, I'm looking forward to seeing if they surprise us and maybe do some things that we don't expect. Um, this the this is a, this is important, man. Like yeah. they they haven't touched free agency really. They haven't done really anything in the off season to, in my opinion, get better. This draft, they have to have some urgency that maybe we haven't seen from them in a while. And so I'm wondering, is Nick brings up trade backs and things like that? I'm wondering if they do have a little show a little bit more urgency and uh, do some things that we don't expect on day one. 
Robert Belt. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, sweating all the way up to 24, trying to see if Graham Barton's going to come down or not. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's like, I, honestly, <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's all I consider because I've just, I know there's a good possibility he's not there. And yet I'm sitting here just trying to conceptualize reality where he's not there. And it's really tough to then figure out where they go from there at center. Um, and so for me, it's even though I know there are other guys there that, that make some sense, like you just mentioned Troy Fatano, JC Latham, if he gets down there, um, you know, we, we've talked about Kingsley Sua, Montaia, like, like you got these different guys here that you can talk about to me. It's like, yeah. And even if you like those guys and those are good players and you haven't graded where it's still just as when that pick happens, if, if it's somebody on the Barton, I'm going to be sitting there going like in my head, I'm going to be thinking, what the hell are they doing at center next year? Like, like that's kind of going to be where my head's at. So I think that, you know, it can even make sense that a guy like Fatano, I'd probably take him over Graham Barton sitting there. But even taking him, I'd be sitting there thinking, I don't know what's going to happen at center next year. I don't know how this is going to look. And that, that to me is just the biggest question heading into this draft is what's going to happen at center. Um, and so for me, I, I think it's going to be just watching the board fall and see if he's even there for you at 24. If you guys were sitting in that war room and all of your thoughts are percolating, do you feel like that they have a handle on your issues right now? The things that you guys are thinking about? Do you think they have a handle on how the board's going to fall? Or are, yeah. are we, or is this for the first time in a long time, there's that chaos that we don't know? Is there, do you feel like that they, I, I mean, I, I feel like they're going, of course they're going to get a handle. But are, right now I wonder, if they do have how, that, handle. like like how predictable they think the first twenty three sure, picks go. Sure, I, I think the I think teams usually have a better beat on how things are going to fall yeah, ahead of them do. than than we realize. Um, but I mean, it certainly happened before. The Cowboys openly acknowledged when they picked Ceedee Lamb. Like we had every mock draft right. scenario we yeah. ran, he didn't get down there. And yeah. so and so like I mean, things, that scares me a little things bit. Things can happen in front of them and, and can be unpredictable, but. I think they probably know where their landmines are, where where they know like, hey, if we like this guy, we got to watch out here, here. If we like this guy, we got to watch out here. And I think they they know what's probable yep. and and what they're looking at. Yeah, I, I think that they've got a handle on that. I agree with all those points, and but with that being said, kind of hearing all the smoke from the insiders and people that know a lot more, sure, than us, like the Daniel Jeremiah's of the world. Um, I don't so, know if they know more than us, but <laughs> yeah. But I, I would I would I would say that just kind of hearing from what they they have been communicating over the last week scouts are fearing how wild this is going to get on thursday night yes um mm -hmm. you know that there's there's an element of unknown that has been kind of more prevalent this year than in any other draft um and uh, the, the trades kind of play into that that's uh, that was kind of part of the my, my first answer as yeah. well you know when does that start firing off and when does the board kind of shaking up with different teams in different slots i think you know you really won't know what the board will exactly look like until probably pick 12 is off the board <laughs> and then you can kind right. of have a level of expectation until 24 but up until 12 i mean there's a lot of things that could happen why do you embrace the chaos uh, i don't know if i embrace it because y'all know i got anxiety but at the same time i i just think nick br brings up a good point of just how top heavy this uh draft is in some positions and then obviously a lot of the teams that need quarterback and just how that's gonna fall i mean uh i was surprised that you answered the way that you answered though bobby as far as like uh brian asking is do you think that they have a good beat on things? I interpreted that as do you think that they feel the same way about center as you do? That's how yeah. I interpreted it. Fair. So so you're talking about Graham Barton early. I thought that was how I thought that was where because I I think I don't know all the info, but I do think that there is some confidence in Brock Hoffman. Hoffman. Sure. And so I wonder. I don't think it's enough. Personally, like we don't think it's enough to be like, oh no, nah, we don't. We can grab a center later. But what if they really do feel like that from the inside? No, I, I mean, I think, uh, I, I, I think that they absolutely would operate with Brock Hoffman at center because they need contingencies in place. Checking. I don't think that's anywhere near their their optimal plan. If you gave them a, a number of different options as to here's how the the offseason can play out. Here's how the draft can play out. Here's how your your lineup can look. I, I don't think their preference would be that 
that's your starting center next year. Mm-hmm. Again, I think they they they've got contingencies in place. Chuma Idoga last year was a contingency. It's somebody yes. in place that that can start if you need him to, but that was not what they they desired necessarily. That wasn't their primary option. It was just one that like, hey, if we need to do this, we can. And so I, I think that the question for me is going to be. Do, if it's not Barton, if it's not Jackson Powers Johnson, then do they like Hoffman as an option more than they like Frazier as an option? Sure. Do they like Hoffman more than they like Van Pran as an option? Like, are they looking at it that way? Or do they get all the way down to like if, if Hunter Norzad mm-hmm. goes in the, you know, whatever it is, sometime day three or whatever else, however early he goes, depending on how teams like him, like, would they be willing to have a center they take on day three that they think? No, this is still a better option to us. That's what what yeah. I don't have a lot of clarity about. I think they would absolutely take Graham Barton and start him at center next year if if he was there at twenty four. Yep. It's just a matter of you know what are their contingencies behind it. How does Brock Hoffman fit into that? Yeah, and for me, it falls back into kind of the tune I've been singing since the, we started. This is we with how season long these seasons are getting. There is so much value in having backup offensive linemen that you really think can go get it and aren't going to drastically change what you do offensively if you need to do it. Um, Because we we saw, like, it came down to the wire as far as the division goes, and one or two games that you dropped because – your offensive line play wasn't great, or the, the, the coach got a little <laughs> because the offensive line wasn't in place. I think that matters. So Brock Hoffman falls into that category to me with the TJ Basses and things like that of, like, these are adequate backups that we've kind of seen be able to do some good things. I don't know if that means that they're just ready to go out there and start when you can get, you know, a guy that can come in there and make a difference right away see, in this draft. See, I, I do think that they believe T.J. Bass could start. I yes. believe he could start I, I, as yeah. well. Yeah. I, I, th- yeah. I, think, I think there's a lot more confidence in Bass right now at guard than – now, I don't know, is there – a lot more confidence in the idea of Bass starting at center over, you know, Hoffman at center. I don't know. But in terms of just talking about Bass playing guard, Hoffman playing center, I think this organization has a lot more confidence today, right now on April 22nd, and the idea of Bass starting at left guard than they would in Hoffman. How do you feel about that? How would you guys – do you, do you guys think that TJ, TJ Bass is capable of playing center? It, we just got to see it. We haven't really seen it. The mm-hmm. only times we've seen it is in practice reps. We saw it a little bit in training camp reps. But uh, you got to see it. <laughs> that that's that's it. For okay. me. Kind of felt that way about Barton playing center, right? Coming out, of, you know, watching Duke. I'm like, I've yeah. seen him play tackle, but you know, I, you've I, seen what he did freshman year, though. No, I, there's, no there's, there's, yeah, you, you go back and you there's you at find, least context, yeah, you know. Absolutely, but absolutely. I, I think with T.J. Bass, I mean, I, he's the guard of the future. I, I think. think he's the guard. I think he's the guard of the future, yeah. and he's probably going to be Zach Martin's eventual replacement right. if he doesn't slide into left guard this next yeah. season, um, or or if so, still. But I, I mm. think you just kind of need to see what he's going to do at center for, for me to be able to buy in completely. But I think as it sits today, there's a training camp competition lined up at center between um, Brock Hoffman, TJ Bass, and then whatever draft pick comes in. Yeah. I'm so. so excited for a center competition. Aren't you guys? We <laughs> yeah. haven't had one, and had one on all. this team in a minute, and that was weird too, the lack of competition there. I mean, it was just, it was Tyler Biotis' job just because he was existing. Yeah. Nick, I got a question for you. Throw it at me. Quarterback, offensive line, wide receiver cornerback which run is going to go first okay are we going like outside the top five here i would assume yeah okay so like outside outside those top three quarterbacks and a couple of those receivers going um let's see let's just take a look at my mock i'm going to stick to this um i would probably lean more towards i i've just been feeling that these corners are going to come off I, I really do. I, I got I got Quinion Mitchell coming off at twelve, Terry and Arnold at thirteen, Nate Wiggins at fifteen. I, did I think, you have Mitchell above, or did you just do it because of the mock? I I, I have Mitchell above as well. Okay, yeah, that, okay. that as well. I, I have Mitchell as my number one corner. Okay. I, I love what he brings to the table from an aggressive uh, aggressive standpoint. Uh, press off the line, being able to yeah. pair routes. Uh, I, I love what he does and what he did at Toledo. Those four interceptions in a game. I'm going to bring that up a million times before yeah. the end of the Northern show. Northern Illinois. Uh, but uh, I, I think I think. I th- I'm leaning towards the corners now. Could the receivers happen? Absolutely. Could the offensive line happen? I think so, absolutely as well. You got Joe Alton, uh, Taliesse Fuaga, mm-hmm. and my mock that are going before Mitchell. But I think I think teams start looking up at pick 12, and Denver's going to be looking to parachute back probably. I think if they don't go up and get McCarthy, and uh, someone's going to hop up to 12, I think and get a corner. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking, and it starts to run. Bobby, what? listening. To, oh, go ahead, Aisha. I was going to ask, why do you? Oh, no, you're host. No bad. No, go ahead. What okay, you got? I was going to ask, why do you think there's going to be a, a run on corner? Yeah. When, with, with corner, again, with how deep corner is. Right. Because 
yeah, these guys are the top guys, but when you get into the second round, you find good things in a lot of even the second round guys. Yeah. So why do you think that they will go get corner? Yeah, you look at those names at the top and you and you see them slip into twelve, and I think that's that's probably where they go and be aggressive. This is just a guess here, complete guess. This oh, no, this I, board I, can no. fall a million different ways, but I, I think when they look at twelve and Quinion Mitchell and Terry and Arnold are still on the board, people start getting on the phones because those are two good of talents to not go in the top ten. Bob, Bobby Nick thinks the draft is going to start at twelve. You there with him? Um, I don't know. I mean, look, the way the... Uh, Am I right about that? Nick? Yeah, that's, read, that's probably yeah. about it. Probably 11. I've heard it 11. twice. Yeah, I've heard it twice. Yeah, look, I mean, the the way uh, the the way all these stories are starting to come out about Jaden Daniels is not sure of his... Uh, <laughs> wants to know what options he might have other than the commanders at number two. Like, I mean, that that could kind of throw a monkey wrench into things. Obviously, who comes up and, and gets either the Arizona pick or the Chargers pick, which is what we assume. It, it may not happen, but if, you know, who the Vikings are assumed to want to come up and, and get a quarterback or something like that. So, I mean, there's there's some fluidity uh, in the in the top 10. But, I mean, yeah, right around 11, uh, somewhere in there, especially since that's the Vikings pick, like whoever trades down there, how things shift. I mean, I think you'll start seeing some wild stuff happen there. But, I, I mean, in terms of the run. Yeah, I was going to ask you, where do you think the run's going? Offensive line. Like, like to me, because it's Safe. just it's so – that there are so many good offensive linemen at the top. But it's just it's like once you get past like a collection of eight to ten guys, it just it drops in the quality pretty quickly. So I think like teams are going to just be like got to get one of these eight to ten. If we want an offensive lineman, let's do this now. Like we need to get. So I, I think Alt, Fashnu, Latham, Fuaga, uh, Suamataia, Mims got like you start going down the list. I, I think that by the time we get out of the top 50 picks, most of those are going to be gone. Aisha, though, offensive line run bad for Cowboys, right? I mean, yeah, but the way that we've talked about it is like even if they if there is a run, there's a possibility that you mean you mentioned. I think that there somebody's going to be there that they're interested that sure. they have some interest in if if it falls correctly, especially if it doesn't start to twelve, right? And especially if they don't start boogieing to twelve. So, I mean, I think um, I, I think it could be harmful. But then also too, you brought up and you've brought up multiple times that the best player on the board might be a defensive player yeah, at I, that yeah. point if that happens and people just like i want all the offensive linemen nick will everybody go nuts if they pick an off uh they pick a defensive player at 24 i don't think everybody would go super nuts but there'd be some questions especially if it's like byron murphy that plays at three tech or yeah. if they parachute back to like 30 and take edger and cooper or peyton wilson in, in that sense uh th then i think there would definitely be some questions that would have to be answered that night one press conference if you if you back up to 30 bobby linebacker or maybe Frazier at center. I mean, that's how I would look at it. If you backed up to 30, you know, we went, we went through all the, and you guys did a great job the other day when we went to the trade back scenarios of, of kind of, we've all determined that we want Kansas city to call right now yeah. is who we would like. But Bobby, uh, if you were to trade back, is it still one of those offensive tackles? Is it the center now? Or could the best player on the board be a defensive player? Yeah, I mean, man, if you pick up the extra draft capital, then I don't have a problem if you go back and say, we're going to take Cooper here at Texas A&M. I, I don't have a problem if that's what you do. Depending on how much capital you pick up, say, what can I get? Because, I, I mean, I think this is a relatively deep draft at other spots that they need. And so if they pick up extra capital and say, hey, we can get you know Cooper here because I think that that's a, a – bigger ask to expect that he's going to make it to you in the second round or, or to be there later than some of these centers that you might like that, that could get to you in the second or third round. I don't know if Frazier gets there in the second round. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, like that you are going to have other options there like Norzad and Van Pran and guys like that, that I think with the you, extra pick. Yeah. With the extra pick okay. that then like you're still addressing some of the other things that you need to do. So I don't have a problem if they, if they take Cooper back there, um, I, I would, I would feel like going back to 30 and taking Frazier, at least just for me, would be a little bit of a reach compared to where I have other centers. Like, he's he would be the third one, but there's enough clustered around it. Whereas with Cooper, like right behind him, you're talking about, like, Peyton Wilson, who's a really good player, but there's obviously a ton of questions medically. And then mm -hmm. after that, there's a significant drop. I don't love the linebacker class. So if you can get Cooper, I think you can get away with center, third round, something like that. Yeah. Aisha, you want to follow up with anything on that? Mm-mm. 
All right. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I was just listening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One cool. thing about my mark about going back to the to the runs, I just kind of counted before pick 24. Mm-hmm. Six offensive linemen coming off the board and three corners, but I just have those three corners coming off a little bit quicker. Um, but I, I still expect there to be a run on offensive linemen. I, I, I still do before 24. Mm-hmm. And that's, man, we're going to be sitting around pick 18, pick 19 on Thursday night, just praying that there's not another tackle that comes off the board or another center that comes off the board. <laughs> All right. With that being said, though, on the potential run, how willing are you all, before we go to break, how willing are you guys to just sit there and let it happen? Yeah, and not trade up. And not trade up. Yeah, that's that's where it gets interesting because you don't have a ton of draft capital this year. You probably don't want to sacrifice some next year, even though you are expecting comp picks next year. It just depends what kind of assets you're willing to give up. I don't, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can I, either. Like, I mean, they're just, they're, they, they've they made a conscious decision to Barton. address the depth through the even Barton without Barton. At, Barton at 19. It sucks. It's a reality of the draft. That sucks. And, and But, I mean, to me, it's like you, you've made a conscious decision to, to replenish your depth through this draft, and that's without a fourth-round pick. You can't give up anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I just think they don't have – like I said before, they haven't done anything. This is their money maker right now, so they need to yeah. go in and go in there with the mindset that they have to get better. So, however they decide to do that, uh, you, you're saying you don't think that they should uh, ransom any picks for next year or anything like that? Um, no, like I mean, I, I think like the 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 that's a good question. Extra capital that they have being in the like fifth round, I don't think <laughs> that that's going to be enough that somebody will be like, yeah, I'll take a fifth rounder next sure. year to let you move up five spots in the first round. So it, you don't have the cap and the capital it would take to move up using next year stuff. Like you're, you're going to start depleting again, the the top it's a little bit of you're chasing your tail after that. To me, it's, I, I'd much rather either stand in and pick or move back and try to pick up something else to me. Like, it really doesn't matter who it is. Trading up is not something I would want to do. So we're we're a team now of like we're interested if we don't have our guy blow the hatches and go yeah. and die for the bottom, right? Yep. Okay. Man. Oh lordy. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, that's tough. You know, that's tough because to me, I just think there's so much. I think there's a lot of unknown there. You know, and then if you're not willing, like you say, you seem like we're. I don't know kind of willing oh we won't take Frazier might be a reach I don't look at it really that way myself oh that's just a, yeah that's just on my board they may not view yeah. it that way and yeah. if they look if they evaluated Zach Frazier as being somebody that they felt comfortable with taking at 30 yeah like I'm gonna assume they've got him more right than I do because yeah. they've got a track record of having guys no, more right and, than and I and you're have. right no you're right and I, I just like I said I, I I know he doesn't get to you at 56 I know that for a fact. So anyway, <laughs> all right, we're going to take a uh, first break and when we come back. We're going to get to your Twitter questions. And then after that, though, I got some more questions for my scout buddies here. We'll do that all next. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. I'm Darren Woodson, former Dallas Cowboy player and Super Bowl champion. When I played in the NFL at a high level, I relied on my vision to see the field. As I started getting older, I noticed my vision wasn't as good, and I was getting frustrated from wearing my glasses all day. I went to Laser Care Eye Center and Dr. G talked about all the options. Thanks to technology and Laser Care Eye Center, I can see near, far, and between. Don't fumble your vision any longer. Visit them at dfweyes.com and tell them Darren sent you. They got me back on my game. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or anytime you want to munch. 
And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Come out to the Star in Frisco for the Dallas Cowboys Draft Weekend presented by Miller Lite. The party starts on Thursday, April 25th at 6.30 p.m. Enjoy live draft coverage, player appearances, live performances, and more. On Friday, come back for the draft night out with alumni, Dallas Cowboys cheerleader appearances at the Miller Lighthouse. Then finish strong on Saturday with the Draft Day 5K presented by Baylor Scott & White Health. For more details, visit DallasCowboys.com slash draft. And uh, this, uh, the draft show is presented by Miller Lite. It is a taste you can depend on. And also this segment is brought to you by your Texas Ford dealers. Ford is the best in Texas. Okay. We all running that 5K on Saturday when we get done? You know what? I thought about it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I thought about it. Just like show up and you're like, you know, like Rich, uh, Rich Eisen does with Run Rich. Yeah. Show up in like your draft day shirt and all that, you know, kind of give it, you know, the khakis out there, <laughs> giving it a go. I think I could maybe make it, maybe a 5K. I'll make it a 1K. I can make it. Yeah. I think so. A 1K? Yeah, I'll make a 1K. <laughs> Get away from me, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's uh, it's time for one of our favorite segments of... Twitter, Twitter on the 20. 20. Thanks, Beamer. Appreciate that. Okay, guys. First question comes from uh, on Twitter is from Let's Talk Ball. Let's Talk Ball says, say your team is definitely picking one of either Peyton Wilson or Jonathan Brooks in the second round. Which one do you want and why? Nick, I'll go to you first on that go one. Nick, go yeah, Nick. so um, on my board, I'm going to stick to it. Uh, I would take Peyton Wilson uh, mm. just just based on what he brings to the, to the table. I like I, this. I think, I think he – the medical concerns are there, yes. And, and from what we've heard, it's not – you know, there's not anything that makes you feel great about where he is medically, uh, but you you can look at the past two seasons, him staying healthy, uh, these last two seasons for the Wolfpack, what he was able to do on the field, what he was able to test at the combine. You see all that athleticism, what he can do. I, I, I want him in that second level flying around the field. I think you could still get a really good running back in the third round uh, that you can throw in and, and into the RB1 conversation next mm-hmm. year, whereas if you're looking at the linebacker position after Edron Cooper and Peyton Wilson, there's a little bit of a drop-off there in my opinion. Well, after Junior Colson as well. There's a little bit of a drop-off there, um, and you'd have to be comfortable taking a guy there in the third round or on day three that you feel like could compete. I feel like Peyton Wilson would be more of an immediate contributor in that sense, um, but I, I think uh, you can get a running back there in the third round as well. It'd be tough for me to pass on Jonathan Brooks, so I love Jay Brooks. Aisha. Oh, I was like, I was looking for Bobby. You, I want to bounce off Bobby. Bobby, what you got? Uh, you know, it, Brooks, and it's nothing to do with Texas. It's Got everything yeah, to do Bobby with it. That no, no, no. It, it has nothing to. It has nothing to do with the Texas stuff. It has everything to do with, uh, you know, we we have Dame Brugler on here. Uh, Dame Brugler from straight from his draft guy talking about you're talking about double digit surgery since senior year of yeah. high school, and, and it's not just. Well, it's this one knee gun problem. No, it's both knees. It's a shoulder. It's this. It's that. It's he's already 24 years old. Um, he, he's a really good player. To me, again, we're talking about the the margins are so thin in terms of making sure your depth is set for this next year and what you have moving forward. I we, we saw just what an unexpected injury in DeMarvian Overshone did last year at linebacker for the Cowboys. And and there's a little bit of an expectation, I would think, with Peyton Wilson of like he's going to get hurt at some point. Yeah. And and even if he stayed healthy for two years, something will happen at some point. And I just I don't know that they can have their depth challenged on that. Um with Brooks, there's nothing long term about Brooks's health. Uh, everything you hear is that he is salt of the earth, high character, high football character kind of guy. Um, and, and to me, he's the best running back in the draft. So to me, it's it's not very difficult because I think as you're trying to minimize risk and, and you know, build the best possible team you can, to me, Brooks is higher on my stack to begin with. And then the risk is so much less with Brooks compared to Wilson. Yeah, I mean, for me, I... With, as far as Brooks goes, yeah, he's the safer pick. Yeah, for sure. He's the safer pick as far as, you know, you talk about the injury history and all that stuff. But I struggle. But I, I'm t- I'm, I 100% I can't wait to be able to hear some of these conversations in these war rooms after it's all said and done with the conversations of Peyton Wilson. And I think for this team in particular, you need a Mike. 
Like, you need a mic, even if it's of the future. And this is, to me, the best mic in this draft. Maybe one of the best mics we've seen in a minute um, and how he communicates, how he processes. And I think Nick brings up a good point of what he showed at the Senior Bowl, what he's been this last couple of years. I can't imagine. I wonder, has anybody asked him what he puts into his body, hmm. how much work he's put into his body to even be able to stay healthy that last couple of years? I mean, yeah. Peyton Wilson is is a star, I think. And so it is hard um, in that regard. But I think Jonathan Brooks is a safe pick as we as we sit here right now in Shefty post that uh, Brooks is connected to the team. Yeah, no, we know that right now. <laughs> yeah. That's why you watch the draft show. Right. I'm standing at that table with those dice in my hand, Nick. Yeah. Aisha, I'm standing there. Yeah. I'm ready. Peyton Wilson? Yes. <laughs> I, it's it's yes. that serious to me. It's hard. Yes. Yeah. I'm standing there and I'm, I'm looking at your guys – Putting your chips where they need to be, yeah. Because we're about to we're about to let these dice Look, fly. Man, I will it's be shedding a tear. One. I will be shedding a tear while those dice are flying because I love Jay Brooks. But yeah, I'm with you. Who do you have ahead of Peyton Wilson? No, I, I'm said Brooks is. He a, said Brooks. I, I have Brooks as a as great at Bobby, higher. Bobby's than, betting than on me. Than snake. No, like here, here's thing. the thing. I think I think again when you watch, they've made certain. Now, look, they've got a, a long history of taking red flag players, medically red flag players in the second round. They've got a long history of taking medical flagged linebackers. Uh, yeah. Bruce Carter, Sean Lee, Jalen Smith, Damone Clark most recently, Leighton Vander Esch. Like, they've, they've done it consistently. So they're not afraid to do it. But I do think that, like, we, we got to put into the context here as well that they said – we we need more reliability, so we are willing to walk away from Hall of Fame left tackle and put ourselves in a position to where we're we're kind of in need walking into the draft. So if they were that concerned about reliability on that front and affordability, um, I, I don't know why they would want to put themselves in that position okay. at linebacker again after they've clearly made some stuff of like, hey, we need we need more availability. We need to know who's going to be consistently available, and that's just never been Peyton Wilson in his entire college career. But he's he's really good. He's a fun player. It sucks. If, if you told me he'll be healthy for ten years, Brian, I'll sure go yes. run it up there. I'm I'm, I'm channeling my, my Jeremiah, Jeremiah Trotter. Trotter. Yeah. I'm channeling it. Yes, and this well, there's some fate here with his son in the draft. There's some there's some yeah. I'm feeling it. I'm do you think some it. of that confidence though comes from like I I wouldn't I don't want to I don't want to say the wrong thing, but <laughs> to your point, I don't say, welcome to the draft show. But, <laughs> but Bobby brings up the fact that they might be more hesitant because of the recent history and then also too you know they've 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 seen what it's like to get a second round player have do their surgery do all their medical and all this stuff and then and then they're not on this team or they're injured uh often so i wonder though if there is some I mean, some arrogance there about what they're capable of doing in this building, from a, especially from a medical standpoint, and their um, team doctors being as good as they are, and all that stuff. I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's arrogance. I, 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 don't wanna, I don't know. The no, no, no. I know. I know. I think it's. I think it's uh, where they're comfortable taking calculated risk, and they typically have said like, "We'll bank on talent versus the risk." Like, if we're there in the second round, a lot of times in the first round, they're banking on projections raw talent whatever else but i mean there haven't been like a whole lot of you know medical concern or you know character flag players that they've taken in the first round they generally are are more just making an evaluation picking the player and going with it there vander esch was obviously a first round pick and there were questions there but i i think that what they've shown is they believe that the second round is area where they're willing to roll the dice and take some risks on the opportunity to potentially have two players that they think are first round worthy like yeah. okay cool we'll do that in the second round we'll, we'll take that risk there they're less willing to make the risk when there's probably a lot of other first round players around their pick and so let's go with something a little safer whereas in the second round it, it may be well that's the last guy who's a first round type of talent and nobody wants to touch him because the medicals will will chance it we're gonna roll the dice on I, I don't think it's necessarily that they think they're more equipped than everybody else to handle it mm-hmm. good conversations mm. all right um Josh Weaver wants to know, and Nick, I'll start with you on this one if we could. We're speaking of linebackers. Can you give them some? Can you give them some day three linebackers? Day three, day three. That get significant playing time this year that are drafted by the Cowboys. Significant playing time. I'm going to start with that part of the question first, just because 
you would have to you would have to figure in how they get around Demarvin Overshone, Damone Clark, um, and Kendricks Eric Kendricks. Is, yeah. Um, but I, look, let's 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 bite for a second. Some day three guys that they have been interested in throughout the process. You could look at Jordan McGee out of Temple. Um, you could look at John Trey Hunter out of Georgia State. You could look at Curtis Jacobs out of Penn State. Nathaniel Watson out of Mississippi State. I know those are four names really quick. Let me dive into those mm-hmm. each individually really quick. Jordan McGee, more of a narrow uh, guy that you could you would like to see play in space. Uh, he's good in coverage, but might need to uh, bulk up a bit. Even though he is about 225, 227, he could add probably 10, 15 pounds to be able to be a run stopper if you wanted to or he could stay at that weight and kind of roam in coverage there on uh, on third down uh john trey hunter actually very much of the same kind of skill set i like mcgee a little bit better than hunter uh nathaniel watson that's the guy who's gonna you know come downhill and be able to make those tackles in the run game uh he almost did that exclusively for the bulldogs last year he was sec defensive player of the year last year uh curtis jacobs i think this is more, one of the more fun day three yes, linebacker yes, options yes. just because he he's versatile he can do both of these things i think he's still got a ton of upside that you can add to his game this is a guy that i think a couple of years from now if if you have to move on from kendrick's after this season i think this is a guy who could be ready to step in on day two a couple of other names i want to throw out there tyrese knight out of utep i really yeah, love his athleticism that's what game. i was hoping that's what i was hoping you would mention man I, his athleticism is awesome uh, and to be able to bring a, a minor over from el paso that'd be super cool to have once again in the building and then a uh, last name i'll throw out that he was really productive for washington last year and was huge in their playoff run edifuano lafoscio I, I think he's um he's a guy that can be more well-rounded as well ceiling probably not as high as Curtis Jacobs is uh, but I, I, I still like his upside Oh yeah, I I wanted to comment on Curtis Jacobs. Uh, we got to we had the pleasure of meeting him at the Shrine Bowl, um, and I but I want to say though you were talking about like he hasn't really had a lot of injury issues or whatever, but this 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 is this is an old man a little bit like he's 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 played a lot of football, which yeah. is a good thing. It's it's a good thing, but I also understand that. There's tread on those tires as far as how much he's played in his collegiate career. Was like fifth year, sixth year, I think he played five, six years, mm. if I'm not mistaken, um, from what he told told us. But I think uh, I agree with Nick that I do think that he would be a cool uh, day one guy to be able to I mean, day three guy to pick up and bring in here that can really develop into someone that can really uh, be the quarterback mm-hmm. back up there and on the second level. But then also too, he does come with some experience because he's played so much football. Right. Right. A 45 games for a four year guy, uh, but 45 games. Good insight right there. Yes. Uh, I mean, I do like the name John Trey Hunter. I think that that's a good one. I I think that that's somebody who can, you know, he, he can play inside or outside. He's more well built i think than a lot of the linebackers that we've seen this one he's a brick i I think that when you watch the tape against lsu like you see him against big competition you see him making a difference and and those are the kind of games that you really need to zero in on and and feel like you're you're getting nfl level competition or high level competition preparing for the nfl but the other name i'll mention here is steel chambers at ohio state who's a converted running back and i think he's somebody who consistently feels like we've talked about you know with linebackers here over the last couple of years that you know okay what what are their abilities to you know read and react how good are their instincts things like that 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 is the one area where he's really good and i don't know if that comes from being a converted running back but i mean he really does seem to see it quickly and attack it and and plays discipline the biggest problem with him is he's light He's like 225, We're I think. We're dealing with a lot of these guys in day three like that, aren't we? Yeah, Some yeah. lighter type players, though? Yeah, he, he's light. He's he's going to – and it shows up. Yeah. There are times he has trouble getting off of blocks. He, he, he doesn't play with a lot of power. But I, I think, you know, if you get him here and you feel like, hey, we can fill out that frame a little bit, I think the instincts are fantastic. Um, it's going to be really hard, I think, to find anybody who can come in and start for you at linebacker this year on day three yeah. um but I, I do think that steel chambers is somebody that interests me as a a project it's crazy that you bring him up because i've talked about him on girls talk boys talk a couple times yeah. and um i think to your point with the instincts and being able to i if steel doesn't if steel chambers doesn't do anything he to me because he is a little lighter he can be your special team's ace I think he's a guy that can come onto your team, your special teams, and make a difference immediately as well because of the instincts, because of the way he's able to he's able to read and react. And I do think he can develop and maybe put on a little bit more size, a little bit more weight because he is a little light in the ass sometimes. But I do think um, he he does show some of that decisiveness that you are looking for from a linebacker. I but I personally think if a team gets a hold of him, he can really, really, really make your special teams uh, better immediately. 
with how he plays. If I can mention, I don't know if you guys have seen this guy. I mean, there's a lot of linebackers to look at real quick. And But J.D. Bertrand from Notre Dame. Right. Okay, I'm just going to say a couple of things about him. He's 6'1", he's 235. He is one of the quickest readers of scheme that I've seen of these linebackers. Mm-hmm. There's been some good ones, but I think this guy – his ability to process information quickly and react to the play. He's got a quick trigger to way he plays. He's downhill. He's a good tackler. He can fill. He plays in space. The instincts. This might be a day three guy that I don't know if the Cowboys particularly like him, but I know watching him play pre-snap, letting his teammates know where he, what's about to happen, the fundamentals. Maybe he doesn't have the greatest athletic ability and the lack of length might hurt him some in the NFL. But, man, he made it work for this Irish defense and the way he played. So keep an eye on a guy, J.D. Bertrand from uh, Notre Dame. I, I haven't seen him yet, but looking at his uh, combine photo here, he's got a first-round graded jawline. He looks like a superhero. <laughs> he's, a, he's a square-built guy for sure. Okay, our final question uh, for you guys on uh, Twitter on the 20. Would any of you guys be surprised if Johnny Newton, the defensive tackle from Illinois, would be the pick at 24? That's coming from Raul. Yeah, that would surprise me. Um, It would be fun, don't get me wrong, but yeah, it would surprise me. A, A, it's kind of the same reasons we talked about why Byron Murphy would be a little bit of a surprise. I I feel like Johnny Newton would be even more of a surprise only because, you know, he was a guy that they really haven't done a ton of homework on uh, over the course of the draft process, didn't have a formal with him at the Combine, didn't bring him in for a 30. So um, I I think to pull the trigger on him at 24 would be be definitely, it would definitely be interesting. I kind of, I think I have him going 27 in my mock, 26. Mm -hmm. uh, to the to the Buccaneers, so um, he he, sh- he could be right in that range, but man, he's he's he is fun. He'd be violent pass rusher. He's a guy that I think can line up inside, outside. He's he moves like he's two fifty, but he's not. He's he's fun. Be funny because I, I literally as soon as you said the Bucks, I, I pictured him in a Bucks jersey, and it looks right. Yeah, him mind. going back home to Florida, that'd be fun. No, it looks right in my mind. Uh, yeah, I I, I agree. I, I guess I would be surprised, but correct me if I'm wrong. Did did we have him from any type of did, – did the Cowboys have a 30 visit with um, – what was the offensive lineman that they were going back and forth with Mozzie about? Bergeron. Bergeron. Did they have a 30 visit with him? I don't I remember. Don't recall. I'd have to look that up real quick here. So I don't believe that – I don't believe – if I'm remembering correctly, mm-hmm. we didn't start – think we didn't think about him until the week of. Right. Like, we had talked about it. We had talked about him as a player, but – they hadn't really all of a sudden he's shown up as a player. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. he wasn't publicly like. Did he have a thirty visit? Uh, I no, I, that that I don't remember. But I, I, just, I know they met with him at the combine and stuff. But the, that's the, just what came to mind. Yeah, the bigger thing with that is just the on on Bergeron like that that filled something that they needed. And, and this year it feels like you've got even more challenging depth issues. And that's one area where it's like, well, your starters in place. Like mm-hmm. you've got a three technique. So I would be surprised if it was any three technique with that first but if it was byron murphy if it was johnny newton i I would be really surprised if they picked a three technique defensive tackle in the first two days all right well appreciate all the questions there on twitter on the 20 thanks to uh to you for uh, guys out there for making the time for that okay when we come back uh it'll be the final segment of the day for the draft show uh i've got some more uh questions i want to ask my scouts and we'll do that next Hi, Drew Pearson, former Dallas Cowboy and now Pro Football Hall of Famer here. If you're struggling with your vision and tired of those contacts and glasses, don't throw a Hail Mary. Go where I went. Laser Care Eye Center, the official LASIK partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Drew, thank you so much for trusting us with your vision correction procedure. At Laser Care Eye Center, we offer six different vision correction procedures to help patients see. Check them out at dfwis.com. Tell them Drew sent you. Hood, hood. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With Blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. 
Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl, handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or any time you want to munch. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. All right. Hey, I'm going to try and sell you on some tacos and tunes. How about that? Head to the Miller Lighthouse at AT AT&T Stadium for the Dallas Cowboys Tacos and Tunes Festival presented by Miller Light on Saturday, May 4th from 3 to 7 p.m. Enjoy a variety of tacos from the regions across Mexico and food food truck fair while you sip on cold drinks and listen to live music. Admission and parking are free. Visit attstadium.com slash tacos and tunes for, for more info. See you there. Hey, we still selling our draft guide? We still putting that yes, out? Yes, we are. Still absolutely. putting that out? Okay. Yeah. Make, sure, make sure that uh, we're doing part of that. How do we do this, Nick? Do you uh, have a plan for this? Do we go on DallasCowboys.com? Yeah, go on DallasCowboys.com there on the front page. Uh, you should be able to scroll through that little centerpiece, and you'll be able to find a place where you can buy it. It says big in big letters, buy now. So go buy it now, 10 bucks. You'll have it on your doorstep by draft day, and you'll be the smartest guy in the room. There you go. All right. Thank you very much for all that. All right. As we uh, finish off this final segment of the day, um, Bobby, I want to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Your second round graded player who you wouldn't be surprised ends up getting taken in the first or maybe higher. If you look at your board, who's the one second <laughs> round player? His I just know somebody I have graded in the third round will go second overall. Talk so about it. That, there, there's that. So I'm going to adjust a little he, bit. Does he say, hate our? Does it? Is it their notary? Does he hate the LSU quarterback that much? It's Drake May, I think. And no, 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 he, no, no, no. It's, it's Jane Daniels. Daniels. He hates yeah. Daniels. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. it's uh, yeah. Poor man's Lamar Jackson. I'll pass. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that uh, you know the guy that you don't study tape. We, all we that talked. To, we talked about it. Like, calm down, uh, LSU. <laughs> um, okay, Brooks over the really good linebacker. <laughs> Y'all mean him. Get it, get it. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, look, uh, I, I look at it. Second and I round say, guy, yeah. Second round Cooper, guy. Cooper, Edron Cooper. I, I, I think Edron Cooper is a guy who, who very easily could end up back into the first round. And I, and obviously, I mean, like we've maybe even higher this. than the back of the second round, or no, no, no or sorry, back into the first round. Like he's a, okay. he's a guy that I have okay. in the second that I think could because I think there's teams that probably have him as the top linebacker and are willing to say, hey, if, if we have a need here, we're going to say, if you look at like the, when we get to the conference championship games, one of the things that's funny, because we're sitting here talking about potentially these could be the Cowboys first two picks. If you look at the center position and you look at the linebackers on the four teams that finished in the conference finals this year, yeah. it's they, they all were really, really good. And they've all invested there. San Francisco, Kansas city, Baltimore, Detroit, They've all invested in those positions. They've all had quality players there. And I, I think that Cooper is a guy who – it became a little bit like linebacker, was. it felt like was the running back of defense for a little bit in terms of how people were valuing it. It feels like people are kind of coming back around and saying, no, there's some value here. You can't just throw anybody out there. And so I, I think Cooper, because of need – you know, lack of talent at the position at the top end. I, I think Cooper could get, you know, somebody could grab him back into the first. Aisha. Uh, for me, you know, Nick talks about the run on cornerback happening. I look at all these cornerbacks out of side of, outside of Keon Mitchell, and I look at Terry and Arnold, and I, 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 I like the player, but there are some things I didn't like. Wiggins, you talk about the size. Sure. I think that Cooper DeGene from uh, Iowa could most you. definitely be someone that someone takes in the first round. Um, this guy, when I watched him, and again, I think Keon Mitchell is fantastic. I, I really don't think he's that far away from Mm. being that complete corner that can do it all. He can play in zone. He can play in man. He's disciplined. He has good size. He's a strong tackler, multi-sport athlete. The guy's done it all. Um, Very productive in his time in Iowa. We know how the rest of the league views some of these Iowa players. But this guy's just a dog, and he's he's just he's consistent. And we talk about we talk about. 
Jackson Paris Bowers Johnson yeah. and just the consistency. I feel like Cooper DeGene has kind of suffered a little bit from that. Is that he's so consistent that you almost forget about him. And I'm not going to let people forget about him. I think the rest of the I think there's people that might be okay with taking him in the first round even over like a Wiggins just because of the size and some of those things. So, that's just me. That's how I feel cuz if there's a run, it's going to have to be more than two guys. You can't have like three guys. It can't just be two guys in that first round. So, I'm very interested to see if whoever takes Cooper DeGene throws him in special team situations. As a returner? He, yeah, because he was so fun yeah, as a returner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then sprinkle in that, too. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah. this is this is a exciting, multifaceted player. Yeah. And I think teams value that. But you also get a corner that you know is going to come in right away. And you talk about the confidence. You talk about how intelligent he is. I think he could come in and, and hold it down. So that's yeah. my guy. Yeah, my safety one. That's that's my safety. You one so petty. Board. I think t- I think I think I think people might look at Tyrion Arnold as a safety. Oh, want to get into that? No, I, I'm not going to get into it like that because we've talked about it before. I just think the length and some of the stuff he does. Yeah. I think that some people might look at him as a safety. Boy, that guy Detroit went from being what a kind of a corner safe, Brian branch branch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Boy, he played well for them. Yeah. Played in the slot right. too and stuff like that. Who do you got, man? What you got? You got when you got uh, second. So I only have 19 first round grades. So there's yeah. a lot, honestly, that I that will be picked in the second round. Obviously, sure. so I'm gonna kind of think outside of the box here a little bit, um, and, and not even too far outside the box. Uh, Lad McConkey out of Georgia. Oh, ha! Uh-huh. Yeah, I know that's it's a, it's a name that's been very hot. Well, I guess uh, I'll get for, to my next for, question. <laughs> yeah, for, for late <laughs> yeah. in the first round, uh, teams like him. Uh, teams really like what he sure. brings to the table as far as lining up inside, lining up outside. You see his athleticism, um, all of the concerns that I think he had coming into the draft process from an athletic perspective, he has answered. So for teams at least, and I, I think he's a guy that'll probably end up late first round uh, potentially. And then Darius Robinson out of Missouri Edge, uh, he's just picking up so much steam to be a late first round pick. And I had heard that in Mobile, that was a first time I'd heard that hey Darius Robinson's gonna be a first round pick and I'm, I'm still standing on that I think I'm gonna stick to who who told me that so uh, give me those two guys I believe that go ahead I'm sorry what about the what about the te- did, what happened with him was it this was it the Darius combine? Robinson but yeah I felt like I felt like people stopped talking to, uh, the media folks yeah us folks I think we stopped talking about him after the combine because it wasn't super special you know what i'm saying right. like he didn't stand out like that but when you watch the tape he's just yeah. this freaking bully yeah when you're a 280 pound edge i don't think a combine's necessarily your 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 best friend I necessarily agree. from like a testing perspective but I, as far as him being able to line up anywhere from three tech outside to seven i think i think there's a lot of things he can bring to a defensive line okay. he's versatile and that's that's where that's where you get the value in darius robinson is his versatility bobby is hicks got a shot from washington state um maybe i i i don't I wouldn't think so, but I, I, I mean, I, it's definitely possible, I guess. I mean, Hicks, I think, is going to be the first safety for a lot of teams. So, yeah. I, I mean, if somebody wants to, you know, address that position back into the first, I don't, I don't think it's like a terrible reach either. Like, I really like Jaden Hicks. I just, I don't know that the demand is going to be there. I don't know how many people are going to have Newbin over him. And yeah. I actually think the trendy thing, that's, that's one of the areas where I think we, you know, in the media talking about it, we've been behind the NFL I think most of the NFL has Hicks above Newbin yeah and and so that's one where like I think the draft Twitter social media sphere has not been in lockstep with them on that so I think there's a good chance Hicks goes before Newbin I just don't know if it's back into the first yeah I mean I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that and I think Newbin's fantastic and he can play some free safety some uh, strong safety mm-hmm. um but it's also too with Jaden Hicks, and again, it's not the time. Newbin doesn't do it, but it's just how he feels in the run game yeah. too. Yeah. And with just how many how many teams are doing things, trying to get guys out in space and stuff, having a safety that can cover ground like that. But I also like how he operated in dime. I was surprised yeah. by just how comfortable he is um, uh, covering all that ground and 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 in carrying defenders. So yeah, with Jaden Hicks, is I, I agree with you. It's it's kind of like how we look at Edrin Cooper and Peyton Wilson. It's like 1A, 1B in that situation to me as well. Any chance that Corley gets picked in the first round? I don't I don't think so. I would love that, but I don't think so. You want to start a heard, fire? I haven't heard a lot of smoke around around that. I, I think when you're talking about those receivers who could go first round, it's kind of limited to Xavier Worthy, Lad McConkey, Adonai Mitchell, yeah. um, probably those three guys. And I, I, I think if you go beyond that, then you're still talking Keon Coleman. Yeah. And then maybe you start talking about Corley and Leggett. But I, I think those are comfortably second round guys. Y'all think nobody's going to 
get googly eyed and take Xavier Worthy just because he's super yeah, fast. Definitely yeah, definitely could. Oh yeah, they that's, will. That's what I'm oh, saying. Yeah. Like oh, they, yeah. would, I mean, they would be jumping yeah. on a guy like Worthy know, before yeah. before a guy like Malachi yeah. Corley. Okay. All right. In the uh, in the last five minutes we have here, this has kind of a, been a touchy subject for a lot of folks, but I'll ask this question. Let's piss some people off, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you guys stand on all these potential medicals that we're dealing with? We got all these medical things that have come up about these players since the combine. We've, you know, whether it's the center, the linebacker, the running back. Where where are you guys? Are you numb by it? Are you <laughs> do you are you saying, listen, I, I trust my team's gonna do the right thing, you know, if they take my guy, obviously cleared. I mean, there, I, I just feel like there's a lot of good players. I think there's probably more There's players on our board that we haven't even talked about that have medical things that that probably that all of a sudden we're going to be like, OK, Nick, who's your who's your best player? And then all of a sudden it's three guys that you're like, I don't understand why they're falling. Yeah. How are how are you guys taking all this medical information in now? And how is it affecting how you think about your board and your players? I'm trying to keep it very circumstantial and put each guy in kind of a vacuum of what they're dealing with. But it, you do have to kind of factor in a guy like Graham Barton, who's de- who's been dealing with a torn labrum throughout the draft sure. process. And that's something you just we just haven't talked about because yeah. we've been talking about Jackson Powers Johnson and his medicals. We've been talking True. about Peyton Wilson or Jonathan Brooks, et cetera, et cetera. Latu but from UCLA. Latu, exactly. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of guys, I think. Is is there a little bit of numbness? I think there is maybe for, for me media scouts but you can you can best believe that if there's a pick made by any of these 32 teams they're doing a lot of research as to what they are getting medically from that from that player i think uh i I think there definitely will be two or three guys we look at around like pick 30 and we're like why are these guys falling so yeah which could help the cowboys very well good so we'll see sure bobby how do you feeling about all the medical information you're starting to get yeah i think the stuff that i can that that's just out there publicly on display for everybody to see you know Latu was medically retired for his neck. You know Peyton Wilson has had a bunch of surgery since high school. Like, those sorts of things there that I can see and I can discern, it's like, that's right there on the table for me. I don't know how comfortable I feel going after that. So so those are those ones. The other ones that are murkier, you know, Jackson Powers Johnson, where you, you hear rumblings of stuff and hear things like that, I don't know how to feel about it if – the team says we're willing to take him. I'm going to trust that it is because I have no clue. Right. But like, there, there's nothing that I can know about those medicals and know if they're okay or not. I didn't know. Like, like you hear rumblings about, oh, there may be something with Leighton Vander Esch's neck when he's coming mm-hmm. out of school. But like, you didn't know how it was going to play out because there wasn't anything really on the record about it or anything that was out in public about it. Um, and ultimately, that one didn't go the way they wanted. You talked about the Jeremiah Trotter one where yeah. he ended up playing ten years. Um, and so. To me, I'm I'm kind of neutral when I hear something about Jackson Powers Johnson or or Jonathan Brooks or one of these guys where, okay, I, I can't know specifics about it. If the team says they're comfortable with it, I'm going to be comfortable with it. But the ones where it's like it's publicly out there, I already know a medical staff retired law too. I yeah. already know there's been a million surgeries to Wilson all over his body, not in just one particular part. Those are the ones where I go, I don't think I'm very comfortable taking those guys. Wow. I mean, and when you talk about center, I know how – center crazy you are yeah brian your top three centers have all all, have all dealt with injuries at this point because frazier dealt with the knee as well right so it's 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 i think it also it depends like like nick said he doesn't he tries to put them in a vacuum and kind of sort out okay what is their position what do they do um how how much depth do you need there whatever the case may be i think that for me is what plays into it um because even when we were talking about Brooks earlier, I mean, yeah, like, I don't like the fact that he's had an ACL, but he can recover from that. Now, if this was like five, six years ago, maybe I would be more concerned because the committee aspect was not what people were doing like that. You had, like, a guy that ran the ball a whole bunch and then a couple, maybe a couple of gentlemen just fill in here and there with mm-hmm. short yardage situations. That's not what football is right now. Right. These wide, these running backs are being asked to do more wide receiver things as well, and they're lining up outside and stuff. It's not – this game isn't as punishing to me from the running back position. So I might be a little bit more open. So I think it also just depends on the position, what you – and also, to the specific depth on this team and what you need from that play right away but these are the top three centers have all are all coming off injuries man, sure. or they have issues yeah well, that's all the time we have today thanks my scout buddies thanks nick harris bobby belt aisha morrison uh thank you guys out there for for uh 
taking us in today. Uh, another, we got draft shows all week. Yes, all sir. Week. Damn so we right. got, yeah, we got a draft show tomorrow, same time, uh, 11 p, 11 a.m. Central. Uh, we will uh, chop this up a little bit more as we get closer to the draft on Thursday night, which we'll have uh, coverage on uh, not only DallasCowboys.com, but also, though, on 105.3 The Fan as well. So we're working together as a team here. So we've got you completely covered. Uh, until tomorrow, uh, keep scouting, keep evaluating, and uh, we'll, take, uh, we'll uh, check you guys tomorrow. Take care. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?